103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Digital Free Thought Radio. Hello, and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, December 26, 2021. I'm Larry Rhodes, or Daughter 5. And as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. I got the toasty hands for Christmas break. Toasty hands <laughs> for Christmas break is my new um, Christmas song. I'm working on it. It's going to be cool. syndicated. It's going to be <laughs> make a lot of money. <laughs> and warmers. Okay. Our guest today is uh, George Brown, two and a half, from Brooklyn, or formerly from Brooklyn, now in Tennessee. A digital free thought radio hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. Mm. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in town, where well, you're probably not. And here in Knoxville and in Southern uh, Bible Belt town, we have a group of over a thousand of us. So there's probably more than just you and your town. Uh, we'll tell you more about that group, though. However, after the mid-show break, Wombat, what's our topic for today? Teach me right the first time. And the reason right. why I want to talk about that is many fold, but we'll get into the meat and potatoes after we check in on everybody. George Brown, how you been since last week? Oh, pretty good. I uh, confess being opposed personally to YouTube, I mean, to, to uh, Google and Facebook, which makes my life a real challenge. Oh no. Um, how so? I, That's such a weird thing. Cause everybody, I mean, everyone would say they're without them, their lives would be so much more inconvenient. Yeah. That's true. Or boring. And, and, Hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, so if I, you like arguing on the internet, for sure, Larry yeah, does like so his I, trolls. I mean, I, I am deadly opposed to being surveilled, and these are surveillance businesses. Hmm. They're in business to surveil me, and I, I really resent that. So, um, however, I am a hypocrite, and I confess, Lord, I <laughs> am a hypocrite because I cannot live without YouTube, and I have found that uh, Google Street View is essential for me yep. when I drive to Knoxville. Mm. Mm. I mean, I, I rehearse. Yeah, I love this. I love Street View. Street View is really I, good. I, I rehearse yes. the trip before I go. Let me throw you something out that will blow your mind, too. You get an Oculus Rift that has Google Earth, which has all the Street View camera angles in it, and you now have virtual reality access to any part of the planet. I did a virtual walkthrough of the Grand Canyon. I was just like, it's just like almost being here. They play the sounds. They have like soundscapes of people walking through the Grand Canyon there with you. And you're just like, this is bizarre. You can go to museums. What's that app? But you know what? Under? Google Earth, but for Oculus oh. Rift. You can check out any museum you want. And I think the museum experience makes way more but sense. But guess than, what? Yo, what's up? My, I'm my street is not on Google Street View. What? Wow. Yeah, well, either it's, it's brand not. new or it's just way the, the drivers are like, I'm not driving down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's more like that. It's, yeah. it's more like that. But you asked me what I'm up to. Is, okay. um, I, I have been uh, connecting, uh, setting up stereo components to use with one of my computers so that I can understand people better okay. on um on you on um, YouTube because a lot of people record themselves so badly on YouTube. Sure, right. You can't right. understand you know them. <clears throat> I'll yeah. throw this you know? out. Uh, final tip from George Brown: We will we will suffer bad audio, but no one's going to sit through a video with bad. I'm sorry, we'll suffer bad video, but no one will sit through a video with bad audio. Audio right. and good a lot audio of it is, is the number one. Yeah, a lot of it is really bad. bad, really mm -hmm. bad. And yeah. at my age, I am losing some of my hearing. Exactly. Not only that, but just like quality of hearing. People have sure. misophonia. Buffalo. Yeah. It's yeah, good we to got see Buffalo, you. Buffalo, another guest. Hi, Hello. Yeah. How you been? Welcome and how was your Christmas? It was great. How was yours? Not bad. Not oh, bad. Hey, yeah. it's radio. Hi, George. How? How? <laughs> what did you do for your Christmas? What was your? Uh, what was your sneak present for the kids? I heard you got socks from. Um, sneak uh, present for the kids. Yeah, I, I yeah. set I set up my old Lionel train set. Oh, very cool! Which I, which I haven't played with for years, and really I'm preparing to sell it. So I'm gonna I get it set up. I'll take yeah, some movies more. and some, video, some pictures and see if somebody is willing to buy it. Uh, but 
the the kid the kids were into it for a short time and then they yeah. were no longer into it. Yeah, and, uh, that doesn't bother me because it's kind of product of the age, I guess. Sure. Um, and it's not computerized, so. But uh, okay, that's it worked well. It's more for you. What I love about it is the fact that you can have another chance to fall in love with it before you actually sell it, and you might be like, you know what? I'm 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 taking this one. I'm I'm keeping this one. I, this is <laughs> yeah. one thing. This is but one the thing. problem is. But, but I'm not falling in love with it because I can't crawl under a table and pull the wires through and do that stuff like I used to be able to do. Who says you can't? Uh, Who says you can't? Uh, I, my is it your wife? Says I can't. Okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. You can just can buy I, a can I tell my? Can I tell my, a, a little tiny Lionel train story? Go for it, go for it, go for it, George. When, when I was a child, I was given two sets of Lionel trains, which were already were antiques. And my mother made me give them away when I was a teenager. So I gave them to the caretaker of the Brooklyn Music School. He was a Hungarian refugee What he for his kid. And what he did instead was he sent my trains off to Hungary, <gasps> where they probably got burned out on 220 volt power. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> so let me back up. Are these trains electrified? You have to plug them into yeah. the wall? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. that's that shows my age. I thought they were battery operated. Well, that's no way. dangerous as hell. Get rid of those. <laughs> that's a fire hazard. <laughs> get them, get rid of them. Get rid of them. Um, Larry, how you been? Uh, it's good to see you in a Hawaiian t shirt again. Uh, yeah, so. well, it's it's red, red and white. I don't have green, mm -hmm. uh, mixed in, but you got some green in there. Holiday kind of a yeah. holiday shirt yesterday. It was Christmas. But uh, yeah, um, I had a good Christmas. I had good food and good family around me, and it was, it was great to have. <laughs> I also got a Oculus uh, Quest. Let's go. Uh, too. We got to so, talk. We got to talk. I'll tell you some yeah. really great apps. Google yeah. Earth is a good one for you to try. Yeah. Google Earth VR. I, I have been playing um, Resident Evil Four, so that's fun. <laughs> You're very impressive. You're very impressive. That's a uh, terrifying it's, it's a game. Up. Yeah. yeah, it's a terrifying game, especially it's, in VR. Yep. Jeez, but a lot of fun. Having a good if time. you want some real scary games in VR, you should play Half Life, Alex. Now that you said that, I can I, I can pull off this whole other shelf of well, that's, games that's that I recommend. That's the one I want. Yeah, uh, I understand Alex? you have to put it on the computer and then get a cable and play it between the two or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really high powered, but it, yeah. it's still worth it. And it's only a you just need a really long USB C cable. You can make it work. Okay. Um, there's some other good ones I can recommend for you. But guys, I want to talk about teaching me right the first time. Buffalo, here's the here's the concept. You know, a lot of times when you're in school, you're taught things as sort of like a shortcut or as a, a way to quickly understand more complex topics, but you never revisit those simplified models that you had for reality. And Rarely. people will take them out into their adulthood with the same level of confidence they'll have as what their name is or what the alphabet is, or what number comes after what number, despite the fact that that model is not a true representation of how reality works. And I think a really great example, this is a bit heady, but we got it. We're a science show, right? I have, I love this. I love disc golf. And I was talking about disc golf, like almost every day for like a long while now. And it's been like six months that I've been into it. And mm -hmm. one of the cool things about disc golf is the number system that is on the disc, that numbers will detail how the disc flies through space. And one of the numbers represents glide, glide referring to how long it stays up in the air. And I'm like, oh, glide. So this number has higher so glide because the number is higher. And I know what glide is because glide is like how a plane wing works. Like you mm -hmm. have faster air on the top, slower uh -huh. air on the bottom, the higher less pressure, the, the faster air means less pressure, which pushes mm -hmm. the air, which pushes the disc up. And that's how planes stay up in the air. No. Completely wrong, completely wrong. And I'm like, no, that's Bernoulli's principle. Like that is a thing I was taught in high school. That's the model of how things work. I know this for a fact. It's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Why I'm like, why doesn't that make any sense? And I'm not, I'm saying that as if I was telling myself that. In fact, I was actually in a very vicious Discord argument of like, this is how it works. And people explain to me like, no, this is not how it works because there's no rule that says that a molecule has to automatically speed up over the top of a curved surface to meet the air molecule on the bottom. In fact, they more or less move at the same speed and there is a discrepancy in this, uh, or a disparity in terms of like the molecules ever meeting each other. They don't meet each other at the end, which means they don't necessarily travel as fast in the end. The only reason why a disc or a curved foil is what you would call it 
pushes upwards is because when the air travels over the surface and it curves its way back down again, it's essentially pushing air down at the back end of the wing. And by pushing air down, there's an equal and opposite force that pushes the wing up. So if I'm pushing air down, air is pushing me up and that's where my lift's coming from. It's not this displacement of air pressure. Larry, you're giving me that weird look in your face. What's up? Go for it. You're on mute, my friend. He just said equal and opposite uh, for the force on the back of the wing. Well, if they're yeah. equal and uh, then the downward pressure and the upward pressure would equal out and it wouldn't have any effect up or down. So here's the weird thing. Here's the weird thing that Bernoulli's principle is based on the idea that air has to travel faster over the top of the wing so that it can. Well, I, I think we're, we're taking it. Uh, we're not really talking about air traveling. If the disc is moving through stationary air, mm -hmm. then it's the air that hits the front of it. And the air that, that leaves the back of it is because the disc is moving through it there and it moves through it and top and bottom at the same uh, speed but there's more curvature on the top. Therefore, the molecules have to go over more yeah. distance on the top, which would lower the pressure, which makes it work. Now, I don't understand. Uh, so let well, me the, touch on that real quick. Let me just touch on that real quick. Mm -hmm. You are right. There is lower pressure on the top of the wing, in the, but that's not the major force that's causing glide. So there are actually a lot of forces on this disc as it's going through space. There's a little bit of a uh, downward force over the curved surface, which creates mm -hmm. a torque. There's an angular momentum that's going on sure. as it's mm -hmm. spinning through space. Right. This disc is experiencing a multitude of very different kinds of forces. But the major one, the major one that's causing lift is that equal and opposite force that's going on at the back of the disc. It's not that Bernoulli principle uh, pressure lift. If anything, think of it as like 1% that, but 99% that downward force and pushing up. And don't give me that weird looking face, dude. I've had that exact same face. And I was like, you couldn't <laughs> believe we, you couldn't believe how upset I was when I realized that it wasn't that something that I was very confident was true, was not true. Oh, and actually that there are more sophisticated models. Oh, to um, how if you're thinking about electron, um, go oh. ahead, George. Yeah. George. Uh, I, I, I want to I, I return us to, to the basic question. That's where I'm and going. I, I'm, that's where I'm going. I'm going there. Okay. But here's, here's no. the point. Here's the point. We had a model that was explained to me in school that I believed very strongly, but it wasn't a comprehensive model to explain how reality was working. And I realized that it took me more effort to unlearn the bad model than it took me to just learn the new, the correct model from the very beginning. The first time. And I'm yeah. thinking, why didn't someone just explain this to me the way how it was from the very <clears> get-go? Because I would be receptive to it and it would cause me much less stress in my future to, uh, from having to unlearn it. And I thought that's not just applicable to this flying through space. What about Santa Claus? Right. What about death? What about a lot of concepts that are taught to us? Right? Uh, what would happen if ghosts we and supernatural stuff? Huh? Exactly. Whatever yeah. comes up, comes down. Other mm -hmm. simplifications in the science right. evolution, mm -hmm. like the way how it's mistaught or like how germs work or like, like that. electron theory. So that, I want to talk about big that. One. Yeah. George, yeah. come back in. I okay. have, yeah, a couple of issues here. Uh, one is I just wanted to confirm something that you just said. I've had more than one guitar player tell me how they, they wish that they never learned to play folk guitar because they had to unlearn it in order to be able to play classical guitar or anything else, hmm. frankly. And um, well, the other thing is I was wondering, what is the motivation of the people who taught you wrong? Yeah. Why, why did they, why did they teach you improperly? And you know, there, there probably are, are, are different reasons. In, I'm, gonna my, throw, it, I'm throwing one yeah. that's controversial. Buffalo, since you were a teacher, I'd like to have your impact. Typically, when you teach, you teach to the classroom, not to the most interested kids, not to the least interested kids, but the general population. And so if there are kids that desperately want to know this because they're intending to use it in their future careers, you can't necessarily satisfy their interests when you're teaching to the entire class as a, as a public. But you, what you hope to do is give out a basic understanding that everyone can latch onto. And so that way they can like functionally move forward with the class and the people who want to stay in the field can continue to learn. Would you say that's fair or am I off? No, uh, yeah, that, that, that I think is true. Uh, but in this, in the case of science, you're better off because you can, you, you, if you're sufficiently studied, and I would say this applies to your example, that whoever you learned that from was not uh, not as uh, knowledgeable about physics as they might have been. And so 
uh, <clears throat> Uh, my my habit was always if I didn't really understand something from a student myself, I wouldn't try to get by it. I just say, well, let's talk about this later, and then and then be able to study up on it myself uh, to be sure that I'm teaching them the best information that's available from science on that particular day. Hmm. But I but I that. think I think that there there are oodles of people that don't know anything about physics. So yeah. in the case in, in the case of your example. Uh, it's 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 clearly understandable, and and in fact, aeronautical engineers, uh, there was a a thing I read about uh, how they've had to reverse themselves. But in science, it's easy because you just assume that you that the the truth, and as close as you can get to the truth, is the best available information from the best experts. Right, and you can seek that out. And but I, you, can, you can't seek it out in religion, and you can't seek it out in so many other things. Because it, because so many other things are too subjective and opinionated. Right. I, I also think we fall into the, the issue where we tend to stop asking questions as soon as it starts making sense to us, even if the model that's given to us doesn't make truly any objective sense. Or if it makes any, sense to us, we stop asking questions. Or have any relation to reality. Yes. Yeah. And so you'll hear yogis in India, like meditation gurus, be like, the universe is all pizza everything's pizza, your pizza, I'm pizza. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm hungry. I like that idea. I could go for some pizza right now. And next thing you know, that's when you stop asking questions and you gave your credit card to some guy in a pizza hat and it's all downhill pizzas from there. <laughs> Larry, do you have any examples that you'd like to share of like things that maybe we would be better off if we were taught it correctly the first time? Well, uh, simply how nature works and how physics works. So uh, if we were taught that, you know, cause and effect don't rely on anything supernatural, then uh, I think we'd be better prepared to deal with reality around us. Um, it, you know, when you say that if you want something to happen, you need to pray for it. That's a little, uh, strange when it's never been demonstrated to actually work. Uh, there's a group, uh, matter of fact, right now, it's called a real recovering from religion.org is for people who are having a really hard time dealing with reality because their entire life up till now has been, uh, trying to deal with the world through the lens of supernatural belief and religion. And they're having a really hard time, uh, getting through that barrier and returning to reality. Really good point. And the thing is there, that, that, that service is still available to them. If you are uh, a person right. in an authority figure trying to struggle or struggling as you get out of your indoctrination, mm -hmm. how can we get access to recovering from religion? Well, they have a website, just recovering from org, And if you happen to be a clergy member who no longer uh, subscribes to supernatural belief, you've lost your faith. Mm -hmm. There's hope for you to and help for you uh, to be able to retrain for a secular job. They're, they're more than happy to help you. Uh, that group is called the clergy project and you mm -hmm. can find it at clergyproject.org. George Brown, I got a question for you. I was formally trained my very first instrument on the violin. And then I, my mom got a piano and my head was like, screw the violin. I don't understand how a fretless thing that's just based on positions work to find notes. All the notes are right here. I'm just going to hit the notes that I need to piano made so much more sense to me. And I played that for like seven years till someone gave me a guitar and I realized, oh my gosh, this is so much more easier to understand than the piano. I have to, I don't feel like I have to unlearn things on the piano, but I do feel like I have to completely relearn music again on the guitar. And then what you were saying before, where you're like, Hey, I wish I didn't learn folk because I have to relearn classical made complete sense to me because you can fall yourself into a hole if you only learn like one instrument and realize oh, that yeah. there's a completely different system of understanding how musical notation and, and notes and composition works on a completely different uh, instrument. Did you have a similar problem? But you told me you worked on like pianos and then moved to clarinet. What's going on? Oh, it's a very complex story for me about that. I won't get into it now. But um, <laughs> one thing that I do want to point out is that I, I had the good fortune to study uh, music psychology. Ooh. 
at the University of Connecticut. Music it, psychology, okay. Yes, yeah. interesting. Yes. And it just, it, it made so much sense to me, um, especially considering my previous experience working on musical instruments that, um, uh, because I'm not only a performer, but I'm also uh, have, have experience in, in uh, maintaining and repairing uh, acoustical musical instruments. And it all came together for me. So in addressing your issue, Tyrone, uh, from the standpoint of the fellow who I think was the first music psychologist, a fellow named Carl Seashore, down around the uh, beginning of the 20th century, uh, he developed a series of tests for children to help teachers select the appropriate instrument mm. for that child to play. And he came up with like a test to determine what instrument the kid was going to play. So they didn't ask the kid what instrument you want to play. They did like a test. And then well, no, you can, you can ask the kid, you can ask the kid what, what instrument the kid wants to play. Okay. But, but you, you have to understand that um, for me, as a person who's taught music too, is sometimes the child wants to play the oboe, let's say, because his uncle plays the oboe and he likes his uncle. Ah. Uh... Right? I like the trumpet because it's shiny. That's mm -hmm. not going to hold up, you see, over time, so that the child will um, have certain musical abilities of cognition and, uh, and, um, and gradations of finesse for certain aspects of musical perception and not for others. This is very so you can use those perception abilities. And that's just what Seashore did. He issued a set of phonograph records, okay. which tested the child's acuity um, in these different specialized areas of music. Makes sense. And it's, I, I thought, wow, this is so yeah. wonderful. Because, I mean, you got all these kids who were <coughs> assigned, I mean, I like, the clarinet because the band director needed another clarinet player. Right. I see that mm -hmm. as, like, the silver lining to why it's not always good to teach someone right the first time through. Because sometimes you may need to just show them what, what makes, not makes sense to them, but what speaks to them first and then stimulate a love for the subject. And if there's a love there, then they'll, they have the room to explore the other answers and more complex models for how yeah, I'll go for that. works sure. or other realities yeah. work. That's, that's totally fine with me. I can understand that. I just mm -hmm. wish in some cases I didn't have to go through the trouble of unlearning deliberately in incorrect information to, to learn the truer models. And even with the example right. I brought up with Bernoulli's principle, like, yeah, that effect is true, but I mean, I can blow on top of this just as much as I want. And it's not going to fly 40 feet into the air. Yeah. No. <laughs> and I thought that's how planes worked. And I'm so embarrassed that I was exclaiming that at the top of my lungs over Discord. What's up, George? I'd like to interrupt. Um, Go for because it. Go for it. You, you guys have been talking about science. And I brought up psychology. But um, the, the, one, the one place where, where my mind jumped to was history. Okay. Yeah. You know, and oh, yeah, I yeah. mean, it was in, in my own case, it was the history of New York City, which where I grew up. And, and I mean, the history is just fascinating. Mm -hmm. And but the way it got taught to us in school, what did right. I what did I take with me right. all these years later? Peter Stuyvesant, the governor of of New Amsterdam, stomped around Manhattan on his wooden leg and then nothing. You know, I mean, why was he stomping around New York? Well, that's the interesting part. We never got taught that. No, there's a whole might. context of it, of history and information. It's rich and it's interesting and wonderful to know. So, world history for me growing up started at 1492. That was that should give you an impression <laughs> of it. Larry, what's yeah. up with? You? Oh, it's just bottom of the hour. We need to take a oh, break yeah, real quick right. and then come that's back right. to right. station identification. George, this is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour <laughs> on WOZO Radio 103.9 LP FM right here in Knoxville, uh, Tennessee. We'll be right back after this short break. 103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Knoxville. 
Hello, welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Doubter 5, and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's take a moment to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002, coming up on their 20th year next year, not too long now. ASK has over a thousand members and we have a weekly in-person meeting in Knoxville's old city at Barley's Taproom and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top tables. We're usually the loudest and happiest group. And if you would like to join our Tuesday evening virtual Zoom meeting, email us at askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org or letschatse at gmail.com and we'll add you to our uh, list for that group. Uh, you can find us online in Facebook, meetup.com, or just go to knoxvilleatheist.org or, or Google Knoxville Atheist for that matter. Just that simple. Uh, by the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to meetup and look for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one, start one. That's right. Well, Wombat, where you want to pick up? Buffalo George was making a good point over the break in that it's not necessarily always a deliberate thing when you're not taught the right way the first time and right. made an analogy to elementary school. George, would you mind pontificating on that? On what? Uh, Buffalo. Would you mind pontificating uh, that or it, elaborating? It just makes sense to me that, you know, at, having spent a lot of time teaching, even in my particular subject, that I don't <clears> know <throat> nearly everything about it. And if you, you spill over a topic of of biology into physics and chemistry, then it right. just gets worse. Mm. And so, again, uh, it, it's not surprising to me that elementary teachers or high school teachers uh, teach things incorrectly, uh, or that the people who prescribe or design the teaching plans do incorrect things. Um, and so I don't think it's intentional. I think just it's a lack of lack of information and a lack of expertise. Right. Uh, so the best teachers that are frustrated with having to teach superficial stuff probably move on to the better schools where they could teach things in greater depth. And that leaves all the students behind that were in the lesser schools to uh, to suffer even more down the down the line. George, I think that. Um... You know, when I think about the way music is taught in uh, in many states and rural areas, um, the the one thing that comes to my mind, and it's very frustrating to me, is a, a person who learned music in an urban environment, is that people in rural areas know so little about other kinds of music than than what they were brought up with, in which case is mostly marching band in the public schools, because that's all they know. So, so the teachers themselves, that's their background. They've never heard classical music hardly at all. And, and they never heard jazz, they've never heard African music, they have never heard Asian music. Yeah. There is so much more to know. So I, th I think it's, you, you know, the, the motivation for the lack of, of the knowledge is, is the lack of knowledge of the teacher, him or herself. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. how do we in, enlarge the world of knowledge of, of all the teachers? How do we be an advocate of knowledge? In my head, it's like be an advocate of I don't know. Because I think I love were, it. I think yes. George, Buffalo, as you had said, I would love to have you as a science teacher because you have an, a knowledge of what your limits in your learning are. And I feel like if I came up and asked you a weird physics question, you'd be like, I don't know that. You may have to ask a physics teacher or look it up yourself. But the idea that the people I look up to, the authority figures in my life, can admit that they don't know something and recommend a reasonable path for me to figure <laughs> that out on my own. That gives me the tools and the confidence to say, I don't know, and follow those paths. And that is what inspires me to look for better quality information, or at least the, have a process where I can get access to that. And I feel like a lot of people don't get that opportunity. Um, yeah, once you write something down, then you have an opportunity to do it more slowly than if you were mm -hmm. speaking to somebody about it. And you can, that one, that's one thing I love about science is you can introduce then some of the, the lesser considered aspects and and then really introduce some new thinking to the reader that might read that material. Um, and that works in science. I, I, again, with subjective 
subjects, um, I, I could see it would be much more difficult to do that. Yeah, with subjectivity, it always colors more, but I think I don't know becomes more powerful even in those conditions. George, what, or George Brown, what's up? Well, we, we're, we're in a period now when willful ignorance mm. is on the, on the ascendancy. And the, think, oh. the tip of the iceberg on this is, is the, quote, um, critical race theory fighting that's going on. Yeah, so I'll throw out one quick thing, and maybe this is my own irksome moments, but we tend to, we tend to as a society, rebrand racism as if it's a brand new thing every five or so years. And it's just like, it's the exact same thing, guys. We called it bigotry, we called it separation but equal, or we called it uh, civil rights, we called it being political, we call it, like, you just come up with a new phrase for it, but it's the exact same crux of the problem. And regardless of whatever we're calling it, it's, it's still the head that rears its head every, all the time for some people. And I think it plays into the idea of how we teach history and in, in, in why it's a surprising concept that we can relabel it and people are like, oh, it's just, no, it's this brand new thing. Whereas other people be like, no, it's the exact same thing that we've been dealing with, right? Police brutality, all that stuff. <clears throat> and so what I'm saying is like uh, in, in schools, in a more deliberate sense, there have been cases that are very explicit, particularly after the Civil War, where um, Confederates or, or separatists, insurrectionists had told the school system <clears throat> how to teach kids and restructure narratives about America to put certain things in focus and to, to, to avoid demonizing those who went against the United States of America. And what that's typically done has fostered this idea of supremacy and, and unfortunate mitigation of people of color uh, because they're not fitting the narrative. So they become the outsiders, they become the blank Americans, whereas we become the default Americans. And unfortunately, um, as explicit as that is, I feel like it has repercussions because if they just taught how America came about in the first, in the, the correctly, the first way with as true it was, is the mis the treatment against the natives that were here and how we are truly a bunch of immigrants that came in or people stolen from other countries and brought here. If you told the harsh, you know, uncomfortable truth from the very beginning, I think it'd make people treat people more nicely today, or at least respect the fact that you know, yeah, you're here, but it's such a multicultural place and some are more unfortunate than the others. And that has fostered a deep level of empathy in me because now I realize how we all came to be <laughs> I to treat you with a bit more respect. I don't know. I feel like if we got that story from the beginning, it'd be a lot better than literally, as I was saying at the first half world history for my, in my school, uh, ever Alvarez high school, Cal uh, California started in the first chapter was 1492 Columbus coming over here. Seriously. And I'm like, that, that wow. is, that is bizarre. It's so bizarre. Uh, George, what's up? Well, <laughs> you know, that's one. I, I think that maybe most of us got, you know, that same story about the 1492. Oh, no, it's so bizarre. <laughs> yeah. But I was, I was going to say something else that um, uh, a tangential thought, which is, there is something that makes America great, and that is the diversity of all of us. Mm. And that as a society, we're ignorant of, of this great truth that, that we are a polyglot mixture of all this stuff, mm -hmm. all these people with all these wonderful, interesting backgrounds. You know, I, so I, I really feel that, that that shutting off knowledge yeah. is yeah. is a, is a disservice to everybody because the truth is so much more interesting. Mm. Yeah, but but you have to you have to have the time to stuff in all this information or all this entertainment that's constantly barraging. Let's you know. That, yeah, and, and I think I think rather than this, uh, what's what uh, individual study and thought is being displaced with is more and more and more information or entertainment that's being sold in every way, shape, and form. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel I think of it as like a dietary inf information is sort of like a diet. You can get the simple carbs all day long if you just listen to like the twenty four news cycles, or or whatever's on your Twitter feed. Or if you're willing to take the time and feed yourself properly, get some like roughage, get some protein in there and actually investigate. But 
I think all things are good in balance. As long as you know it's entertainment, here's my thing. If you know it's entertainment to begin with and you treat it like entertainment, enjoy your entertainment. If you know it's a simplified model to begin with just to help you not have to deal with the more complex proofs, understand it and teach it as a, here's a simple analogy to explain how this much more complex system works. And you can give me like the whole rain cycle, draw a little circle and be like, this is how rain goes around and how it becomes drinking water and river water. And then the ocean. It's like, Oh, that's a very simplified model. It's like, yes. And this is a model to explain simply how water circulates through earth, but it's not how it actually happens. It's much more complex than that, but I'm simplifying it for you. If people just say we're more explicit with the, Here's a here's an analogy. I will treat it as an analogy, and if I'm more interested, I'll go into the more depth of the subject. But if I don't know that from the beginning, and I believe that's how the system actually works, if I believe Santa Claus actually drops presents underneath my Christmas tree every year until my adulthood, and I have to realize it was my mom the whole time she was lying to me, think about the trauma. Think about the trauma where I have to so go and learn so. that. And imagine people who are religious who think, wait a second, you mean God didn't make an Adam and an Eve and they're in paradise? Like, imagine how much they have to unload just to learn that yeah, Snakes particularly don't talk the guilt. And give dietary it's, advice. It's, it's not Crazy. just a story. It's a, it's a story about uh, sin and guilt and redemption and all that too that you have to carry with you. It's right. not just the facts of creation. How do I become a good person then if this story isn't true? Like, how do you get people to separate those concepts? You have to explain to them at the head of time that like, this is just a thing that people came up with to explain things, but it's not the way how things right. actually are. Right. But it's right. a good story. You might pull some things from it. It's not even that good of a story, to be honest with you. Was, you can check out Star Wars. Even, that's a better story. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> hey, George Brown, what's up? Well, I, 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 not, not having been brought up religious or Christian, I, I have to ask the rest of you, um, what was the misprogramming that you got in Sunday school, let's say? Ah, yeah. As children, I, as children, the, you know, it's your basic question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. For me, when I went to Sunday school, I was literally taken away from my mom, brought to a different classroom full of other kids who were my peers, and was told how morality works in a very simple way. Morality is whatever God says. If mm -hmm. God says it, it's right. And I would write that down in crayon with like yeah. little pictures of things that God was doing, like making doves or whatever. Right. And I would just believe it because that's it's what I was basically false too. Exactly. And I yeah. believed that all the way until I was in college, until I had mm -hmm. an ethics class and the teacher asked the classroom, what makes things right and wrong? And thank goodness, thank God, I had a great ethics teacher because when i wrote down with my belief of well it's whatever god says is true he told me that was wrong and i was very insulted because i was very christian back then <laughs> <laughs> and then he said he started breaking down how morality works and i'm like well i'm gonna have to reread the bible because what you're telling me makes more sense than the answer i got mm -hmm. and when i went through the bible i was like whoa that's immoral that's immoral that's not fitting mm -hmm. and i'm mm -hmm. like i'm uncomfortable but I'm just not going to read well, those parts of the Bible. No, on, a, on a basic <laughs> level, uh, <laughs> obedience is not morality. Morality Obedience is, is, not... is knowing what what is right and wrong to do in a particular situation exactly. that exactly. that would cause the least harm and the most benefit to the people there. It's and, the... and obedience is something totally different. It's not a list of rules that you follow. It's right. a system that you use to weigh your right and oughts. Hey, what's up, George Buffalo? I was going to say my answer to George Brown would be, leave it to God. I mean, that's what I was taught. Mm. Uh, don't, don't think about it. <laughs> don't, don't, go, don't get all tense over something that's problematic. Uh, just relax and leave it to God because God's going to take care of it. I know. A karma. We were taught so, that too. It's crazy. So it's okay to execute the wrong p prisoner because God will. Yeah. God will sort it out in the end. Absolutely. Yeah. You can carry that yeah. argument as far as you want to carry it. Yeah, absolutely. You could, and, uh, you know, look, look at the, look at the crusades, right? Yeah. So, oh yeah. my gosh. They don't uh, teach the crusades in high school either. Another fun thing, like all the crazy, I almost too gory. First. It would raise too many questions. All the gory questionable yeah. things that Christians did in the past are completely glossed over in a lot of history classes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't learn about the crusades until four years ago. And I'm like, why aren't we teaching kids this? <laughs> we teaching kids? Luck, by the way, if, if yeah. somebody's interested, if you can see how that, emotions yeah. are made, the secret life of the brain. I love it. I love it. But yeah, yeah like it, if people really, understood the actual history of Christianity in, 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 on this planet is a bloody, gory, horrible, 
horrible one. And yet, if you talk to a Christian who's wearing like a sweater right now, who just came back from his one day of year going to church and he's got like a, I don't know, a prim, a, pup, a weird dog that doesn't shed and a wife named Aaron or April. Cause it was only, t- <laughs> only two. They would be like, you yeah, know, Christianity has always been good. It's been really great. Here's my Starbucks. We're going to Starbucks now. Natural, it's like you guys natural never selection. Talk. Natural selection is bloody and gory. Natural Period. selection is bloody and gory. End of yeah. discussion. And we are still products of natural selection. And the weird thing is, is it's not the fact that it's gory that makes it untrue. It's that that we aren't teaching the true version of it. And if you teach us the true version of it, we can come to our own conclusions, right? But if you teach us a a makeup version of history or of the religion or of a scientific process, we're not learning the true nature of it. And so what I'd say for like evolution, which is also very gory, very bloody, but true, let me get the true story of it and let me realize what its limitations are up front. That way I won't have to go 14 years of my life or whenever people typically learn about how evolution actually is and then have There's to another, unload all this baggage. What's up? Yeah. There's another aspect of this that goes back to the elementary school. Ooh, talk and to me. Is, when, when my kids were, uh, my grandkids were recently in elementary school and I had more time, I volunteered to you know join in some science classes and teach some aspects of science and boy did i get resistance from two quarters really one the 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 lady who who uh happened to be the most prominent person in the pta didn't like me uh because i wanted to teach some things in a way which were different than what she wanted and then the other aspect was that as soon as i um made some correction to the science teacher uh, she put up a brick wall. She didn't want to have me interact anymore because she didn't know, quite frankly. She right. had pulled this experiment off of, uh, of, of, of the internet uh, of you know putting different uh, concentrations of sugar water that with dye in them on top of one another to demonstrate um, uh, diffusion. And she didn't understand diffusion. And, uh, and when I made a suggestion to uh, correct her experiments so that the dyes didn't all mix when the kids put them in the tube. Um, <laughs> she resisted. And I even gave her the little homemade apparatus that I would use to introduce one layer, the, the, the less dense layer on top of the more dense layer. So they yeah. wouldn't yeah. mix to start with. Uh, she wouldn't even accept that little handmade device because she was embarrassed. Right. So she's got a lesson plan. She's got right. a limited yeah. amount of knowledge. <laughs> It's in the lesson plan that she should treat, teach diffusion, but she doesn't know how to teach diffusion. So I think this is a big component of, of elementary school teaching, and, and it's probably based by the fact that the, the teachers are, are not uh, sufficiently prepared, and maybe they're not sufficiently prepared because they're not really expert in every subject. Right. And that's understandable. Yes. Nothing bad against elementary teachers, but also ego is a big factor in what you're oh, able to in the class. Well, I, I actually, I had to quit because I was sort of banned from <laughs> consideration uh, when I would volunteer to uh, help judge science projects. They, I don't think I was being extreme. Wow. Uh, and and but I was sort of pushed aside. So I don't do yeah. that anymore. Hey, they did the same <laughs> to Galileo. You're in good company. Yeah. George Brown. Uh, I want I want to mention I want to address uh, George Buffalo uh, what you just brought up because um, it brought up something for me uh, I was raised to believe that I had to know hmm. the answers hmm. that it was very deficient to not know the answers and it was very deficient to admit that you didn't know something. And I, I had to get, you know, well on, to, well on into my life before I could, uh, uh, before it became okay for me to admit to other people that I didn't know something, and then that in itself became quite liberating, sure. you know. I, I wasn't blasted. I wasn't yeah. executed by a bunch of machine guns because I didn't know something. Right. You well, know? And admitting a lack of knowledge is the first step to gaining knowledge. Absolutely. You know? raised to believe i have to know i feel like that's the biggest thing that we need to overcome and that's the fastest way we can get kids to want to learn more because when they realize that it's not so much knowing it but having a good means of knowing things well, i think the that's the reason why uh, uh, education is now pushing problem solving as opposed to fact rote right. learning and, yeah. and that's good that's it's not very easy to do 
No. Uh, and we have to have a, a, you know, there's a growing body of facts that it seems like we all need to know. Mm. Uh, I wonder if, if, if it's, <laughs> it's true, earlier very true. Uh, specialization isn't uh, part of this because how can one expect to know everything about everything that's <laughs> sufficiently based upon a body of, of facts produced by the best experts? It's, so it's overwhelming. Are- Yeah, believe it or not, when I was in elementary school, I was actually picked as an experimental kid to do this strictly critical thinking class. Me and like 14 other kids would leave our main classroom. And once a week, or I think it was two times a week, we'd go to this other room where it was another class where we weren't taught things, but we were taught how to figure out stuff. And it was one of the funnest classes ever. And I remember this thing that they would do, they would get like a piece of a a piece of a machinery from like a pasta maker or something like that. And they put on a table and be like, what is this? And you would spend like 20 minutes just trying to figure out what it's used for, where it came from. And you're like moving around. You've never seen this weird thing before. And you're, you're talking with other kids and you write down and they don't tell you if you're right or wrong. They just try to make you think out of the box for, for how could you use this? And we may take like a spiralizer from like a pasta maker and figure out, Oh, it's a doll for like maybe digging into the dirt faster because if you'd spin it, maybe the dirt comes up and they're like, oh, that's very interesting. Well, it's really cool that you thought about that. And I'm like, how fun was that? And then you end up going yeah. back to your regular class and they're like, here's the next fact. Here's the next fact. Here's a multiplication table. Like, I like the other class. I think shops, shops, metal shops, wood shops used to do some of this because they were yeah. teaching mechanical aptitude. Absolutely. It's gone now because there aren't very many people that are capable of teaching it. And so the, the, the shop has been excluded. The, the machines have been excluded. Uh, they're, they're being brought back to some extent, uh, but not for the, the entire body of students. My, one of my granddaughters is sent to a different school to, to, uh, to do what is, is part of the engineering program. And for this Christmas, she made a, a cheese cut, cutting board for, for her mother for a gift. And she used about five different uh, sophisticated woodworking pieces of equipment in that shop. But uh, somehow she was selected to do this uh, or she showed an interest. Uh, And the rest of the kids that are sitting back in in school that are learning more facts don't have that possibility. So uh, there is some stuff available for a select number for, but who gets selected uh, and, and, what does it take to get selected uh, is, uh, is, is a difficult question. I would throw this. Yeah. It, it sucked that I was selected and other ones weren't. I can't imagine what happened if the school was, but also we were literally just a classroom that had like a th- half hour break where we would look at a random object and try to figure out what it is. I feel like any, that's such a low budget. I feel like if we were just implement that, easily. I think any school can do it if they're willing to spend. I'd rather learn that than cursive. How about that? I spent two years learning cursive. I never used it anymore. Let me do more of that uh, critical thinking thing instead. We're almost at the bottom of the half hour. We're going to go to George. What's up, George? Well, I was just wanted to know, uh, Tyrone, where were you learning this in school? Well, which state or like yeah. what city? Which, yeah, which I was in state? California. I was in California, California. Well, and what city? Uh, Salinas, Salinas. Okay. It's uh John Steinbeck country. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I know. Um, what uh, what do you think was the let's say the social or political environment that made it possible for this concept to be available to you? Um, I don't know, but we know California generally tends to be more liberal and experimental. In fact, now it's not the case. Now they they are a strictly teach to the teach to the test school because of no child left behind implemented by George Bush oh. and the, all that funding has gone. And now they strictly only teach the things that are on SATs. And so that's why when I moved from California to Georgia, I had no sh- social studies. I didn't take a single history class because they weren't taught on the, t- on the test. And when I was here, I was learning history for the very first time in my very early adulthood, like wow. 17, 18. And I was like, I didn't know about the Zoot Suit riots. I didn't know what the Civil War really was. I didn't understand what World War One was or where and when it happened. I, but I can tell you everything on the periodic table. <laughs> my reading level was really high. I just needed to be taught right the first time. Just get, teach me, teach me, and I'll be happy to learn. I'm receptive. And I do agree with you, George. It's not that I have don't teach me that I have to know. Just teach me that there are good ways to know these things. And I think I can be very satisfied with that. Larry, what's up? 
I was just going to say, uh, if you if you take that experimental room that you were talking about, where they put like a piece of equipment down and and change the 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 theme of it to maybe put a pig bladder down, <laughs> ooh, <laughs> you know, okay. organic, you know, or a heart, yeah, or uh, you know, intestines, and then say, well, what's this organ used for? Just by looking at it, can you try to figure out? Oh, what, man. what it's for? This would be for pre med, of course. But or, or just, good. just put your hands on it, and then one of my colleagues does that. He goes from school yeah. to school. With a with a uh, human brain mm -hmm. in a uh, in a sort of a rubber sack, and the kids put their hands on it, and they get all excited about going to yeah. going to medical. <laughs> You know the 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 concept of teaching to the test. I think George Buffalo, you will you will uh, resonate with what I'm about to say, because <clears throat> in New York State they have a very rigid system of teaching to the test, which is called the Regents Exam. Mm -hmm. And um, it's brutal. I, and and by the way, I've seen the same uh, materials used in California mm. to the New York State Regents cheating books that are, there's yeah. a whole industry of mm. books, selling books with previous exams in it, Regents exams that children study in New York State uh, just to pass these bloody yep. tests. But it's the the um, the homogenization of, of instruction toward this the standardized tests, which is so mind. It's the homogenization of education for standardized. Tests. That's a great final word, George Brown. Mine would also be on top of that. No child left behind. I actually left a lot of kids behind because it forced kids to only learn what's being taught on federal tests and not creativity or critical thinking. I wish more people would find enthusiasm for the I don't knows and reasonable ways to get information. Well, that's George because Buffalo. it's created by, by uh, politicians who wanted to get reelected. Yeah, 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 <laughs> not teach kids. George Brown, Buffalo, uh, Buffalo, that was a great final word, actually. Larry, we're at the end of the show. You got any final words? Well, if you like this show, be sure to visit the website, digitalfreethought.com and uh, click on the blog button uh, for a radio show archives, atheist songs, and many articles on the subject of atheism and religion. You can find my YouTube channel by searching for Doubter 5 or Larry Rhodes. I have a book that's available on Amazon called Atheism, What's It All About? Uh, thank you for joining us on the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Remember, you can find this show on Apple iTunes, Pocket Cast, Amazon, and podcasts everywhere. Just search for Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Hour. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. And we just see you next week here on Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Say bye, everybody. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Adopt the black cat. <laughs> bye.